All right, that's enough about that. Let's talk about today because this is the last, last installment of this series that I've been enjoying so much, the last installment of Seeds. Come on, who's sad? Say, oh, yeah. oh, is sad? I know, it's so sad. Seeds is over. But it's been good. It's been good. I've been really, really enjoying this and, and just, and just uh, thinking about even how Tiffany preached last week. Pastor Tiffany brought us this message on multiplication. Wasn't it so good? Come on, let's clap at her. <laughs> there she is, beautiful. And it was a beautiful message. It was a beautiful message, especially. And then, of course, next week needs no introduction. As usual, though, I am going to give you guys a sneak peek. We, are, we will be following up Easter with our, our family series, something about marriage, parenting, like the most felt need in our society, our culture, in this world is, is my marriage solid? And if you're not married, probably people want to be married. <laughs> and, then if, and then they're kids. It's the, it's the things people think about the, the most, the most. And so when Easter happens, I'm going to be giving a clear presentation about what the series will be that's following that. And so keep that in your minds. We're, 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 we're going for that. But I just want to talk to you right now as we finish out this series um, about death. We're going to talk about death a little bit. You're like, dang, man. I, okay. I'm so glad I came to church today. You know, we're going to talk about funeral, we're going to talk about death. Uh, have you ever been to a funeral? If anyone ever been to a funeral, just lift your hand at me. Uh, if you've ever been to a funeral, it's probably someone you loved. I know I'm like, I'm already on thin ice with you because you're like, I'm, I'm, I don't want to think about that. We don't like thinking about that. Why is that? That's a funny thing that we don't like to think about it. I've been to, obviously, more than my fair share of funerals. I've done dozens of funerals, and they're, they're, sometimes they're enjoyable, Sometimes they're not. And that's what I want to talk about is like, what's the different? Why are these different? What, what makes them so different? And, and when it uh, comes to somebody's eulogy, you know what a eulogy is? A eulogy is basically a synopsis of like what their life was and that the eulogy part, like I've heard some doozies, man. You know, Susie, you know, it's open mic time. You know, Susie loved to party. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to take that back right here. I'm going to take this mic back. You know, Bob loved his booze. You're like, oh, I'm not. Uh, so anyway, any more prayers? Let's, let's, we ought to pray, I think. Um, it gets kind of rough sometimes. I mean, it could be really good, but it could also be a little hit and miss. And so I know this is live and everything. Sorry, mom, but I've got to tell it again. I'm going to tell more family stories. I was at my, my grandpa's funeral, all right, who lived to like the ripe old age of 90-something. Uh, he was in actually World War II and um, was, was like overseas over there. He's seen some major stuff, my grandpa, major stuff. And that led to, you know, a certain life where, you know, he was trying to keep up with some of the emotional, probably, I'm, I'm, I'm painting the picture here because his life after he came back, he was in his early twenties, you know, and went to the war and saw horrific things and then came back and maybe drank a little bit more than he should have. And maybe was coping in ways that any one of us would if we had been through that. And so, and then of course his whole life happened and his kids, which are, which is my dad and, you know, all my aunts and uncles. And then um, more recently this, I can't remember how many years ago it was, but I was early on in pastoring and there we were in Oregon at his, at his funeral. And <laughs> okay, um, how am I gonna tell this? But as, nobody wanted to do his eulogy. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wanted to go up there and say, I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it because, you know, Grandpa, he had a hard life, all right? And then he made some, some choices and whatever. And, you know, I get it, you know, because I went through that. I made some choices of my own. But let's just put it this way. The aunts and uncles didn't, they were like, why doesn't Elliot just do it? <laughs> He's a nice guy. He's going to say nice things. Why don't we do it? And I did. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. And I, and I, I remembered that. I remembered that, that. Our eulogies aren't all the same. You know, the things that, that set us apart, you know, the, the, the eulogy being a synopsis of what your life is, I would pose this question to you, what is yours going to be? A better question could be, what do you want it to be? Let's think about that. Let's talk about what you want your eulogy to be like. What do you want that day to look like? Instead of being all morbid about it, be like, oh, I don't want to think about that. Why don't we intentionally think about it? Because Jesus did. Jesus said, I want, I want to start off in, uh, in, in John 12. We're going to be in John all day today, mostly in John 17, um, but I'm going to kind of skate through a few chapters here. John 12 says this, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls on the ground and dies, <laughs> talk about death, you're like, so glad I came to church today. This is great. It stays only a single seed unless it dies. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Everyone's going to die. 
I know you're so glad that you're here for this message. But Jesus was face to face with that reality. He was face to face with that reality that he was going to die one day and he had to face his own death and actually probably more so than, than you and I do. He knew it was coming. Today is actually traditionally called Palm Sunday. How many of y'all knew that? It's Palm Sunday today. Like, where are the palm branches? Woo! Supposed to have palm branches in here. When I, was, when I was getting going in church, man, they would bring palm branches in. They'd lay it on the ground. And I'm like, what am I, Jesus? Like, what, why, do, why do we have the, it's, the palms represent royalty? And that was Jesus riding in on a donkey's colt coming into Jerusalem. Traditionally speaking, this is a week before his resurrection. He rode into Jerusalem and they, they were shouting royalty at him. Hosanna, Hosanna, this is Palm Sunday today. And then if that's not, you know, if that's not good enough, then there's another really good name for, for a day, Good Friday, coming up. This Friday is called Good Friday. It's a ridiculous name for, for a day because it was actually the worst day that probably ever happened in the history of humanity. If we call it Good Friday, but it was actually the worst, the worst day that Jesus ever faced because it was the day, the day he was beaten and tortured and died on that cross, that's Friday. It's the darkest day that, I believe ever, ever happened. And we call it Good Friday. It's pretty, pretty ridiculous. And we're talking about death today. Let me, let me kind of explain why I'm, why I'm going this route. We're talking about death today because next week we're talking about life. Next week we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that he, he had to die so that he could conquer death, come back, come back victorious and save you and me. Come on, somebody say amen at me because that's the best day ever. Amen. Thank you, Sandy. I love that. I love that. He conquered death. He conquered the grave, he, but he had to die first. Everyone dies, but not everyone leaves a good legacy. Hmm. Uh, rough. Uh, earlier, I asked you about your eulogy. How does it go? Was it, is it going to be, you know, dad was busy at work. <laughs> dad loved his job, you know, or is it going to be mom was frantic most of the time. Mom was really in, a, she was a passionate woman, mom, you know, very energetic about what I was doing wrong, whatever. What is, your, what is it going to be? Think it through. Like if it's based on how you're living today, what's that eulogy going to look like? I'm here to tell you, you have control. And in fact, unless we think this through, unless we think legacy, unless we think future, unless we think what is that eulogy going to be like, we won't have the tools and the mental capacity, the vision to be able to plant the right seeds today. That's what it's all about. What will the most important people in your life say about you when that day comes? That's what I want you to visualize. That's what I want you to see. Seeds connect to our eulogy because what you plant now determines what people are going to say on that day. And thinking about that day helps us to focus on the right things today. So let's get into this, man. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. We're going to talk about Jesus' legacy. Because Jesus left a legacy, and most people have never thought about it this way, thought, uh, but I'm going to break it down just a little bit. Um, we're going to be in John 15 um, in, in, in this portion. So if you're looking ahead, come on, get on that. Jesus talked about his legacy in a very specific way, and I'm going to show it to you. He, he talked about what, his, what he wanted his life to result in, and it was fruit. Good fruit, actually. And more than that, fruit that remains is how he talks about it. Jesus, of course, he talks about the future like it already happened, which, of course, which he has the right to because he's God. And so he sees it, you know, he, he sees all that. And so when he's talking about his future, it's kind of hard to see because he already knows it and because he's, he's so in tune with what that day is going to bring. But you and I could also have that kind of confidence as well. That's what I'm trying to say. John 15, 16, and 17 is basically a long old eulogy. It's all red letters. And it all leads up to John 18, which is his, him being arrested and then going to the cross. But he's talking those whole chapters before that, and he's basically reciting his, his eulogy. Let's break it down. But it's first of all in John 15, starting in verse 1. He says, I'm the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they produce even more. He's all about producing fruit. Verse 3. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit unless it is severed, if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot produce fruit unless you remain in me. Jumping to verse 16, it says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. And that's it. That's it. 
That's what our eulogy is supposed to look like. That's what our legacy, he's telling us. He's telling us what our goal should be. And then Jesus launches into this prayer uh, in going over to, to John 17. He launches in this prayer that's actually broken up to, if you look at it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it for you. But if you look at it, it's broken into three sections, which is basically his eulogy in John 17. It's broken up into, into three sections, the first of which is what he did, what he did. I want you to write this down in your notes and think about this because this, this applies to your eulogy as well. This, this applies to your legacy as well. I'm gonna use those two words interchangeably today. Jesus begins with his own purpose. Aren't you glad to hear that? Because that's what most of us think about the most is our own purpose. What's God's will for me? What's, what's in it for me? What's, maybe not even what's in it for me, but just thinking about myself and what am I gonna to amount to? Lucky for us, that's where Jesus starts as well. John 17, John 17, starting in verse four. He says this, and remember, all of this is him praying to his father. So Jesus is praying to the Father. He said this, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. By completing the work you gave me to do. The first part in Jesus' eulogy has everything to do with what most people would think about is I want to accomplish what, what God has has put in me, you know, what, what I want to do, what's successful to me. I want to make my accomplishment. But Jesus reminds us so clearly that real accomplishment is doing the will of the Father for our lives. That's all it is. That's what real success is. That's what real accomplishment is. And that's where we're gonna feel it the most is, is, is tapping into what has God created me to do because that's exactly what he said. By doing the work you gave me to do. I wanna do what God created me to do. What good is it is if we retire early and forsake our families to get there? You know, if we're looking at what the world says is successful and accomplishment, having enough cars, having the right kind of cars, is your car run off of a battery or gas, how many cars you got, how many cars fit in your garage, and you know, what age are you retiring at, and how many zeros are at the end of that. If we look at all of that stuff, instead of looking at what has God set in store for me, what did God create me to do? And I'll just, I'll just like make it clear, if you will just take your eyes off of yourself. If we will take our eyes off of ourselves and what we want and begin to focus on God, what do you want? And just looking in his word and saying, what do you want me to do? And just serving him, you will be on track with that. The number one question I might get is, what's God's will for me? Like, just serve him. Just serve him. You know what I mean? Like, I'm supposed to give you some bullet point. Like, there's just one thing. Be an accountant. Like, no, come on, like it's, it's, it's better than that. It's deeper than that. There's so much more to it than that. It's doing his will for you all the time. And where that happens is putting one foot in front of the other, doing his will. It happens daily, moment by moment, breath by breath. What good is it if we go to all those baseball games with the kids and yeah, forget to raise our families in church? you know, and, and help them to win spiritually in life. What good is it if we accomplish everything we want personally and have our eyes on our own life only to find out at the end that it didn't amount to all the things I hoped it would and it didn't make me happy like I hoped it would. And then if you, pick, if you actually visualize that, point all that out, and the people you care about most are standing there over your box or over your vase or whatever you're in talking about you, what are they gonna say? What are they going to say? The second thing Jesus talks about is uh, the people closest to him. What the people closest to him did. So he didn't just talk about what he did. He's talking about what the people closest to him did. And this is where it starts to get the meat of the message here and where I really want to focus in is he was talking about the people closest to him, a.k.a. his disciples, right? And so before you run off thinking, well, this is for pastors that have a discipleship class that they need to get to. No, 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 no. This is for everybody. This is for everybody. Remember, he's praying to his father when, he, when we read this right here in John 17, starting in verse six. He says, I've revealed you. He's, remember, he's talking to his father. I've revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. Jumping to verse 17, says this, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Verse 18, just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. You know what? The second part of this eulogy is so, is so important because it's where many of us don't think this far out. 
We, we think about, well, what do I want to accomplish in life? At the end of my life, in my eulogy, in the, my legacy, many of us don't get to the place, what do I want the people closest to me to accomplish in life based on my life? This is higher level thinking. And you know what reminds me of the most? Parenting. It reminds me of parenting. We can live our lives trying to accomplish our own self. Like even while we're parenting, we can do this because we're only focused on how good of a dad I am or how good of a mom I am instead of what are they really turning out like? <laughs> What's, what is their life really amounting to? It's, it's taking the eye off of ourselves and getting it to the people we love most. It reminds me so much of parenting. That's why I believe every parent is a pastor. I'll say it again a little bit slower because I just saw your eyes get big. I know it's dim in here, but I can still see your eyes. Every parent is a pastor. And I'll say it a different way. You are your kid's first pastor. They'll have another pastor one day. They'll grow up. They'll have their own pastor. They'll have a youth pastor. They'll have an adult pastor, but you're their first pastor. I'm empowering every single parent here, every single future parent here. You are your kid's first. Pa Who's the one teaching them to pray around the dinner table? It's not me. It's not me. Who's the one teaching them to tell the truth when it's easier to tell a lie? You are. You are. So every parent is a pastor. Of course, Jesus didn't have kids, and he was the most legacy-minded, impactful person in the, in the entire world. So if you don't have kids either, this does apply to you still. He left the biggest legacy of anyone. If you don't have kids, just know that you still have the ability to make an enormous impact on the lives of others if you can just get your mind there, if you can get your heart there. In fact, two of the most influential, not the only two, but two of the most influential people in the entire Bible didn't have kids. Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, and Jesus, no kids but they still left an enormous legacy. So even if you don't have kids, this, this applies to you. There are people closest to you. What about your, what about, uh, your nieces, your nephews, uh, you know, the students that you have, your friends, your, your colleagues, your coworkers, people around you. You, know, you don't have to be a natural parent to be a parent figure. <laughs> Jesus is talking about his own disciples like they're his kids. I mean, grown men, grown men, dirty, stinky feet walking around out on the grass out there. And he's talking to them like, you know, you've given me to them. And he's talking about them like they're his children. There's something to that. There's something to that. And then this, this last part of Jesus' famous prayer in, in John 17 goes to a place that hardly anybody ever goes to, which is the impact the closest people to you made on others. It's, it's so far out. It's so forward thinking that most people never get there. It's, it's way out there. It's like, not only what are my kids turning out like, not only what are the people closest to me turning out like, but what are the people around them turning out like? This is, this is, such, this is deep into the pool stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to kid around with you. This is not like your basic sermon, your basic message. But anybody here, whether it's your first time or not, you can grab this and you can benefit from this right away. But I'm just telling you, this is way forward thinking. So important to grab onto. But if we can think that, that way, because this is how, he, this is how Jesus talked about it. It's, it's impossible to miss if you just read his prayer. Look at it in, in John 17, 20. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples of mine, but all who will ever believe in me through their message. All who will ever believe in me based on their message, okay? So it's, it's not just the people I care about, but the people that, that they're impacting. If people don't typically focus on the people closest to them, how much less, how much less are we, are we going that far out to the third degree of impact? But in the mind of Jesus, success is this. I made disciples who are making disciples, who are making disciples, who are making disciples, something we don't talk about nearly enough, something we could talk about every single week if we wanted to, but this is success in Jesus' life. He, it's like Jesus is, is painting this picture for us. Here's my, here's my eulogy, and what I want said about me is that he made disciples who made disciples who made disciples. I'm praying for all those that will come to me believing the message of the ones I sent. It's amazing to me. It's, it's, it's not just your kids, it's the ones they impact. It's not just your students, it's the one they impact. It's not just your employees and your friends, it's the one they impact. So, okay, we've got it. We, we've got this, this chapter down. He's explained it to us. Now, how do we put it into practice? Because I think we need to get practical right here and figure out how, how do we 
make this a reality in our own lives? How do we get ourselves thinking about this? And it's actually, it's actually very possible. If you follow these steps, I, I believe you'll be able to do it. Number one is this. You have to see it. I mean, visualize it. I mean, like, use your imagination. <laughs> I mean, God gave you an imagination, a mind. He gave you imagination. But God calls us. He implores us. He tells us time and time again in the scriptures that you've got to see it. We've got to see things that he's trying to show us. He's, he's trying to open our eyes all the time to his truth, his reality. Um, not the least famous scripture on this is, is Isaiah 43. It goes like this. I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I'll create rivers. But he wants, he's saying, open your eyes up. See, look, it's not happened yet, but it's the future. It's coming. And I want you to open up the eyes of your heart to see it. In order to see what God sees, you have to look where God is. Where is that? It's right here. That's, I'm a Bible thumper. Well, I'm a Bible tapper. I'm a Bible tapper. I'm not, I'm not going to thump it. Okay, that's too much. It's too, that's too mucho right there. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But it's, I, I do tap the Bible every once in a while. It's right here. This is where his truth is found. This, this is where we can begin to see things that are big, that's bigger than us. It's big because our, our culture will lead us astray. People might lead us astray. You know, they, they don't even mean to, but they're just telling us what they think. And we've got to be centered here. We've got to be able to see the right thing by staying grounded right here. And it's not only in the word, but it's in church. It's, it's around God-fearing people, right? This is what's going to help us to see the right things and, and use our, our vision to create that godly outcome. So this is very, very practical. But what I want you to do, this is the practice I want you to do. I want you to visualize your funeral. I've been alluding to it, but I'm telling you literally, this is a practice that people recommend and I, I believe in it. When it comes to creating a, a life plan for yourself or to have some kind of goals, dreams, hopes, aspirations, what do I want that day? You need to visualize that. I need to imagine all the most important people in your life are there. Imagine it. You can do it right now. It doesn't take any extra work. You just think about it. Who, your, your, your pastors, your mentors, your, your, your parents, your kids, your coaches, your mentors, your mentees, the people that, your students, the people, all the people you care about the most are all there. You have to be able to see that and it's gonna help you and the Holy Spirit in you is gonna give you that, that vision to be able to see, what do I want that to turn out like? You have to start by seeing and visualizing what you want them to say and then work backwards from there. If that's the outcome you want, man, he was godly. He stood on the word of God and he, he lived his life through conviction with values. Like it's, it's not my script for you, it's your own script because you have a special plan that God has for you. It might sound like mine, but it won't be mine. So when you're, when you're imagining that, saying all that, it, it forces your spirit and your eyes of your heart to look at that day to, so that you can reverse engineer it and begin planting seeds in the ground that'll get you to that place. But if we never think far enough down the road, we'll never get there. And we'll go, and it's just day by day doing whatever faces us doing whatever. And I, I'm going to talk about that um, right now, in fact, because uh, we, we have these mindsets, these competing mindsets. Once you see it, you have to change your mindset. You have to change your mindset, everybody. Uh, so important. So important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compare and contrast two competing mindsets that are really at war in every single one of us <laughs> every day. And, and one is the normal winner <laughs> day in, day out. I'm going to start with that one. It's the right now mindset. You can even write this in your notes. If you're taking extra notes or if you're in your phone, you can even write this down. I didn't include it in the bulletin or anything, but I was just thinking this through. And as I was preparing, I was thinking, man, if we just like thought about these two mindsets and, and drew ourselves away from the one I'm going to describe, the right now mindset, and brought ourselves to the legacy mindset, we'd be so much better off. But the, the right now mindset says, I'm aiming at what culture defines as success. You know what's, what's successful now? wasn't successful 50 years ago. 50 years ago, what people valued was much different. And so if we follow what the culture tells us is successful, that's a moving target, first of all. And then you'll work for 20 years to get to that, 
to that target and then it'll change on you. And you'll be like, man, I thought it was right because we were following what the culture said we need instead of staying fixed right here saying, no, this is what matters most. What the word of God says matters most. Godly values matter most to me. It doesn't matter what the world is around me is valuing right now. No, I need to f- be fixed on that. The right now mindset looks at what's, what's popular and in vogue and the right thing to do right now. That's the right now mindset. And the right now mindset also says, I'm, I'm so focused on today that I can't think about tomorrow. Come on, is anybody busy out there except me? Am I the only one? I know you're busy too. We're all busy. It's crazy busy out there. Our world is inundated with busyness. But that's the right now mindset is that, oh, you know, I have too much to do today. I have too much to do today. I can't do that. Uh, but if we allow the right now mindset to take over, we're going to eventually lose everything we worked for anyways because we won't have planted any seeds that last beyond today. If you just do today stuff, as soon as your last day comes, it'll all be gone because you don't build anything with lasting value only looking at today. Of course, you're always gonna have tasks to do. You're always gonna have emails to check. I'm not saying to throw all that stuff out. I'm saying we've got to break free from that long enough to look at the future and say, I'm not just so focused on the day that I can't think about legacy. The right now mindset wants us to, to, to react to what's happening instead of creating intentional moments, just reacting to everyday situations, making us a slave further to our busyness. That's what the right now mindset does. The right now mindset says, it's just going to work out. And that's like something I would do. You know what? Everything's just going to be fine. I'm not a stressful person. I'm not worried about it. You know, everything goes going to work out. This is when we basically accept our lack of legacy mindset and say, you know what? Ah, it'll be fine. Probably be okay. We just blindly hope that the right outcome happens. Well, hope it does. No, that's the right now mindset. We don't want that. The the right now mindset says there'll be plenty of time manana. Come on, say it with me. Manana. All right. All right. That's, that's like, uh, oh, how does it go? Manana lo hago. You know what that means? It means I'll do it tomorrow. And that's the tomorrow mindset. I'll do it later. Mañana lo hago. I'm on my Duolingo hard right now. You better believe it. You know, I'm getting after it. I'm getting after it right now. No, we need to live in a better mindset. We're not like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. You know, I'll, I'll draft up a little, you know, what my eulogy might be like. I'll do that, you know, whatever. I'm busy right now. Though. I can't do it. No, don't wait till tomorrow. Begin thinking about this today. What we want to do is we want to live in a legacy mindset, a legacy mindset. I'm aiming at how the Bible defines success. This is not a moving target, but a true and fixed target that will always, always deliver. No, I I want to have a legacy mindset where I don't wait. I'm going to think about my legacy right now. This is the most fulfilling thing I can do with my life right now anyways. The most fulfilled I ever am is when I plan ahead, think about how my children's children are going to turn out and what I'm going to do to help see that happen. That's the, that's the most fulfilled I ever feel anyways. So I'm going to, I'm going to shift my focus and not just focus on what's happening today, but think about generations to come. That's how Jesus did it. And that's how he commanded us to do it. We ought to have a legacy mindset. A, A legacy mindset says I create intentional relational moments towards legacy. I'm going to take back control from a hectic life and create margin for myself, create boundaries for myself so that I am not so inundated with the day to day. I can focus on what matters most, which is the future of my children and my children's children. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. Without this, what I'm, I'm not planting seeds. I'm just eating what fruit happens to be there. And when it runs out, it runs out. I mean, this, this is how tomorrow starts today. The, the tagline of this whole series, how tomorrow starts today is this mindset that tomorrow matters. Next week matters. What, what's happening with my kids matters. What they're turning out like matters. What their kids and their friends are turning out like matters. Jesus said it himself, not just my disciples, but their disciples. That's who I'm praying for. That's, that's who he was thinking of. That's who we ought to think about. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm fired up about this idea, you know. This is big for me because I'm, I'm just like anybody else. Man, I get caught up in the day-to-day I get caught up in what, what matters right now, the, the, the trauma of today, the, 
the burdens of today, I get caught up in it, but without thinking about the future, man, we just, we just won't ever, ever see the kind of result in our spirit we want to see. Number three is this, this last kind of point, land the plane here is, your legacy is the fruit that remains. It's not just the fruit you're producing right now. It's not just the paychecks right now. It's not just the job right now. It's the fruit that remains. It's the fruit that remains. This is a really important concept to me um, because if we don't pass on who we are, it dies with us. That is an unsettling thing to think about, that my life dies with me, that my life is over. When my life is over, it's, it's, I haven't made a difference in the world at all. Nobody I've ever met wants to believe that's true about them, that it could be if we don't learn from the scriptures. We've got to be forward thinking. We've got to be legacy-minded people. We've got to be thinking about the next generation some of you might be thinking, I'm like, this, this, this kid's too young to be thinking about the next generation. Well, the way I think about it is, you know, building a church and, and having a church that's growing and thriving, it's, it's too much work for it to die with us. It's too much work. It's too hard. It's too much sacrifice for it to just die with us. Build some kind of country club church where we just like it, pay our dues and have a good time. And then when it's over, it's over. It's too much work. It's too much work. I'd rather, I'd rather invest in the next generation and have something my kids and my kids' kids can enjoy and grow in that's even bigger than anything I ever did. Is anybody with me on that? Does anybody want to see that too? Come on. This is so important, but if we don't think about it, when's the last time anyone ever talked about this with you? Probably been a while, right? When's the last time we preach about it in church? A while, right? We've got We've got, to, we've got to do this. We've got to, we've got to change this. Um, I, had, I had something like this happen recently, um, something with my son um, who's 19 now. Um, and if, if, I, if he starts having kids the same age I had him, I'd be a grandpa right now. Come on now, somebody. I, you didn't think I could be a grandpa in here, but you know I could. You know I could. But I was thinking about this verse. I was thinking about my son, you know, my oldest son the one closest to childbearing age. <laughs> um, and then when your kids get that age, you'll be thinking about it too, believe me. But um, Isaiah 59, and this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit will not leave them and neither will the words that I have given you. They will be on your lips and the lips of your children and your children's children forever. I, the Lord, have spoken. <sighs> Legacy. Legacy. There was this um, event that my son told me about, because uh, he's 19, like I told you, and he, he works at Domino's with a bunch of other 19 year olds, you know, <laughs> and 30 year olds trapped in 30 year old bodies with their 19 year olds trapped in 30 year old bodies. I'm, I'm not trying to slander. I mean, maybe you work at Domino's, you know, I'm not mad at you. It's, it's a good job. It's a good job. It's good. It's good. <clears throat> but the story <clears throat> went like this where, you know, cause you don't always know. And just cause I'm a pastor, I don't know. Just, just because you went to church your whole life, you don't know. Just because you started going to church, you don't know the difference you're making sometimes. You don't know if they're hearing you. And so Corbin was telling me a story about how he was working with somebody and the somebody he was working with had questions about the Bible. They were like rattling off about church or something in the Bible. And, and Corbin was like, he told me about it. He heard it and was like saying, well, that's not what the Bible says. And I was like, tell me more. Oh, my, my ears perked up. <laughs> He's telling me the story and I'm like, I'm listening intently because I'm like, this is, this is it. Like, di did what I poured in, did it matter, you know? Did it work? Did it matter? Like, because I, I, we all try, any, every parent knows with that feeling. Like, I'm trying so hard to like do something for you, to, to help you understand, to help you know. And he's telling me what he told his friend. So my son is telling me what he told his friend and it was right on, man. It was right on, dude. He was like quoting some scripture. He was saying, no, well, actually what happens is this and that and the other thing. And I was like, yes, yes. Because we don't always know that we're making a difference. We don't always know that we're leaving a legacy behind us. And now I'm, at least I'm getting a taste, a small taste that if I go out those doors, and I get hit by a bus out there, morbid, I know. 
But if I do, I mean, no, no day is, tomorrow's not promised to any of us. I know that I left an impression on him that is making an impression on others. That's important to me because it means I'm doing what Jesus asked me to do. So for some of you here, it might, the first step for you might just be just kind of receiving that, receiving God's goodness, receiving his love and beginning to take his word on in your life because it's got to start with us, right? We, we talked a lot about others and we talked a lot about passing it on and generation to generation, but it's got to start with us because if, if we're not sowing, the, we can't sow the right things if we don't have the right things. And the right, the right thing to have, the, the thing that all of us needs is a right relationship with Jesus. All right, everybody, we just want to have a right relationship with Jesus. And that's probably why you're here today. You're here today because you, you want to make sure that relationship with Jesus is solid. And so for you, any, anybody here today, it might be your day to, to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe, maybe just shore up, and which is an okay thing to want to do. Maybe you used to be really close to him. And on the outside, everyone would look at you and say, oh, yeah, they're, they're definitely good. They're, they're fine. But inside, you know. I ain't walking with him like I should be. I'm not as close to him as I know I should be. I want to be a lot closer than that. If I described you in any kind of way, this prayer is going to be for you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. This is something we do every week, unapologetically, to say, Lord, we just need you. We want you in our, in our lives. And if I described you in any kind of way, just one more time, if... if if you're ready to, to jump on board and say, I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior, or if you're ready to, make, to recommit and say, I'm coming back to you, God. I'm coming back to you. I used to have a relationship with you, but I'm not where I should be, and I know I'm ready to come back to you, and, and God's going to forgive you in that. He's not judging you in, that, in this moment. He, he's, he's welcoming you back home, just like the, the father welcomed the prodigal son back. So if that's you, if I described you in any kind of way, I just want to know who I'm praying for specifically. So if you just lift your hand up and say, that's me. I'm ready to commit, recommit. Come on, if that's you, just lift it up. Amen, I see you. All right, amen, I see you. Amen, I see you too. Amen. Praise God. If there's anybody else, it's all right. This is your moment. Amen, I see you. Praise the Lord. Oh, that's so wonderful, everybody. It's so wonderful. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray as a family now. I want every voice every voice to just say this prayer with me if you would say father god i give you my heart i give you my life thank you for sending your son jesus to die on a cross for my sin i repent of my sin and i come to you fill me with your spirit and make me new amen